everything's set up. Um, is that a reserve? Please wait while the tea is being made. I do oh, have tea. Right. I think oh. I'm get one second. Like I gotta I mute it. That's how Zoom's working. Okay, we're good. Hello. Um, also because someone mentioned it in chat, whenever I do any kind of streaming thing, I always have a little tea with me. Uh, today's mug is thematic, uh, as we'll, we'll figure out later on in the presentation. Um, but I'm doing, I'm doing a lops, uh, excuse me, a lopsang souchong with lemon in it today. It's uh, just the lemon helps cut the smoke a little bit. It's kind of wonderful. Um, so I'll give this just a second as people filter in. Uh, Shara, Marie, thanks for stopping by. Um, Marie, oh, sorry, excuse me. Um, well, it's 6.31, uh, so I may as well get started. And uh, so hello, uh, hello Mysterium, great to see y'all. Um, so my name is Phil Salvador. Uh, I've been going to Mysterium for a couple years now. Um, I, I have not seen you since last Mysterium. The beard is significantly longer than it was before. Um, you know, when you're staying at home, you just, you grow a beard, it's what happens. Um, but I'm a librarian, I am a digital archivist, and I am the author of a blog called The Obscuratory, which is about unusual uh, old video games. And today, we are not going to be talking about Myst. Okay, we're going to talk about Myst. We are going to talk about Myst. But the point of this panel, uh, ages before Myst, is that I want to talk about everything else that's not Myst. Um, Myst was a major milestone game. Uh, you know, it got people thinking about games in terms of being worlds. Uh, so far this weekend, we've heard from a lot of the folks who worked on Myst games uh, about how, you know, Myst inspired them to get into the game industry, uh, all this exciting stuff. It sold millions of CD-ROM drives. But the thing about Myst is that it didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, Myst was a big deal. Um, but there was like this whole host of games and software being developed for years that Myst was building upon. Uh, within the community of uh, people making games for the Macintosh, especially, uh, there were technologies that were rapidly being developed while, you know, Myst was being made. Uh, and it, it, all this kind of shaped what Myst ended up being. So what I want to talk about today is what some of that was. I want to show you what the context was that Myst was happening in. Uh, you know, what inspired Myst, what other games like Myst were being developed at the time. And then we'll also touch on some of the, I think, weirder examples of the way that Myst impacted um, the game and software industry and kind of interactive art in general uh, that I think are kind of fascinating. So there's going to be some weird games today. Uh, I think to an extent this panel might just end up being uh, me rattling off a list of games, but I really hope it, it's helpful to see the context that was surrounding the development of Myst and the fact that it was part of this bigger um, environment that was happening. So we're going to start off way far back. We're going to start off um, I think like 14 years before Myst. Um, the starting place for a lot of this is a game from 1980 called Zork. Um, some folks may know Zork. Uh, this was an early uh, text-based adventure game where you know you type in open mailbox, take leaflet, that kind of thing. Um, it was not the first game like this. Uh, other ones did precede Zork, uh, but Zork was especially influential in just like the folks it was reaching. The idea that you could have this. Um, this like this virtual world you could explore um and it was kind of a foundational title for a lot of folks doing things in the adventure genre uh this was one of the uh few games that uh, i know rand miller had mentioned playing before i know that the millers were not big you know computer game people but this was one of those things that really got them thinking about the idea of creating virtual worlds um but it, when you start looking you know, past Zork, what happens is you start seeing people taking this idea of this text-based interactive fiction game and taking it in new directions. And one of the big milestones for that is, why is my slide not advancing? There we go, is the Macintosh computer that comes out in 1984. Uh, the Macintosh comes along and it can do all sorts of amazing stuff. It can do, um, you know, it can do like higher resolution graphics for the time, like not just, you know, the kind of low res stuff we saw in the text in Zork, but like actually having graphics on the screen. Uh, it came with a mouse that you could use to interact with things. And so, you know, more people started building on some of these concepts of what adventure games were like, you know, taking the ideas from Zork and applying them to this new format. Um, so I want to talk about some of the things that were going on with Macintosh game development at the time. Uh, not a lot of it necessarily impacted Myst directly, but it gives you kind of an idea of like what the tone of Macintosh game development was uh, when, you know, Myst started to be made. So for instance, you have games like this one from 1985 called Enchanted Scepters. 
uh, with this uh, really kind of kind of boring looking king on this throne here. Uh, so Enchanted Scepters was a fantasy adventure game where you know you go through a world and you fight monsters and you have to collect these treasures that are scattered around the world. But it was one of the first games that let you interact with things with a mouse, where you could like click on objects to pick them up. It's still kind of awkward. They were still figuring out the best way to integrate mouse control and figure all those things out. But it was, you know, people taking some of the concepts in Zork. I think Enchanted Scepters is pretty similar in terms of the, you know, the sort of gameplay of it. But uh, finding ways to apply those to this new interface with these, for the time, high resolution graphics. Uh, this game wasn't really a smash hit or anything like that, but what happened was it got turned into a tool called World Builder, where people could make games like this. They could create their own sort of interactive uh, world and stories that they could click around and, uh, you know, interact with objects and things like that. Um, so it, again, it's not something that really directly inspired Myst, but this is what was happening in the Macintosh gaming community in the 1980s, was you had a lot of independent developers uh, making these kind of things, these kind of smaller, independent, exploratory adventure projects. Um, but again, this is all just kind of background, just showing you like what was happening in the years leading up to Myst coming out, just kind of what was happening with Macintosh games. But if we want to talk about stuff that was actually directly impacting Myst, um, one of the interesting ones is a series of games that came out uh, called the Mac Ventures games. Uh, if there's any like retro gamer folks, uh, you might be more familiar with this one because it got ported to a bunch of other systems. Uh, but it first came out on the Macintosh. Um, there are these games that kind of like Enchanted Scepters, you, you click on things in the world to interact with them. You go through, explore, you know, solve puzzles. Uh, you can see this little GIF here, you know, you click on the door, you click the open button. So it wasn't quite this, like, you know, the one click interface that, uh, that Myst has, but it was the idea of creating these sort of like Again, like these, these virtual worlds you could explore in a, you know, a first person graphical representation. Uh, in particular, Rand Miller has mentioned playing the game Deja Vu, which is a like, it's like a noir hard boiled detective story. It was one of the things that really got him thinking about, you know, games as being these virtual worlds to explore. Um, so I, I mentioned that like the Millers were familiar with like Zork and Deja Vu. I know they've mentioned uh, Dungeons and Dragons was kind of a big thing for them too. So they were used to these ideas of like creating these worlds and letting people explore them and interact with them. Um, but like I said, they weren't really big computer game people. It wasn't like they played Deja Vu and said, let's make Myst. Like it wasn't that direct. But what really got them started on the path to game development was another technology that was bubbling up in the Macintosh community at the time which was something that's been mentioned a couple times so far this weekend, actually, which is HyperCard. Um, HyperCard was a program uh, created by Apple for the Macintosh, and it's not really a game creation tool. It was meant to be like a program where you could create these like interlinked, I guess, like stacks of cards, essentially. So like the example here it's showing is like, uh, you know, contacts like addresses and phone numbers like having them all in a file or something like that making these things where you create a virtual like card and then you can click on parts of it and then link to something else and you can interact with things that way which again was meant for like people making you know spreadsheets or recipe books or things like that but you also had folks who saw this interface and said well what if we use this to tell a story what if we use the same thing where you can like you have a picture and you click on part of it to go to another picture. Like, could you do something with that? And that's what got the Miller's attention. Um, the specific game they have cited as being the inspiration to start looking into game development. Like you might expect it was some, you know, big fantasy adventure or something, but it was actually this game here called Inigo Gets Out from 1987, which is kind of surprising. So Indigo Gets Out is this cute little game. It's this cat who goes on an adventure and the cat goes out the door and you can like, you can climb up the tree and then you can climb down the tree and just go on all these little adventures. Um, so it's using HyperCard as like an interactive storybook. Like you can click on the fountain and the cat will attack the birds. Uh, it's a very simple, again, like kind of a mist style. Like you click on something and you interact with it. And it was a very simple interface. And the developer, uh, Amanda Goodenough, said that uh, it was an interface that was immediately intuitive to kids, especially. That like you see a thing, you click on it to interact with it. But that, that kind of interaction with visual storytelling always made sense. Um, again, it just kind of intuitive, even to kids. Uh, 
which is, I think, one of the things that Mist does really well is having an intuitive interface like that. Um, so Inigo Gets Out was one of the things that inspired uh, the, the Millers to get into game development, the idea of being able to use this, this software to tell interactive stories. Um, so that's what they started messing around with. And eventually that's what led to the development of uh, the manhole, which again, this was mentioned uh, during the keynote that, uh, that Rand and Robin gave earlier, that they were just, uh, you know, experimenting around with doing this kind of interactive storytelling and uh, you know Robin drew a manhole and then the vine coming out of the manhole and it just kind of led to that sort of you know one thing leads to another uh, storytelling through using hypercard. Uh, also a note uh, Cyan was very briefly called Prologue when uh, the manhole was developed so technically speaking this is a game by Prologue and not Cyan um, but it was kind of you know emblematic of that sort of development style at the time where you could make these small games. You didn't need a whole team. It would just be, you know, one artist kind of drawing a thing and drawing another thing and things being quickly linked together. You could really quickly iterate making stories this way. Um, and so this was Cyan's first foray into doing this sort of thing, inspired by uh, Inigo Gets Out, the cat game. Uh, and this didn't lead to, you know, a couple more games as time went on. Cosmic Ozzo, <clears throat> excuse me, Cosmic Osmo and Spelunks. Um, similar games in spirit. And even just looking at these screenshots, you know, you can kind of draw a comparison, the visual style of these games to like what they had seen in the Mac Venture games in things like, uh, you know, Deja Vu, even stuff like Enchanted Scepters. You can see this kind of uh, shared visual language as every one of the Macintosh platform was kind of developing these little independent adventures themselves. So these were kind of the multiple avenues that were happening in Macintosh game development. There was some of the adventure game creation stuff happening with World Builder. There were people telling stories using HyperCard. All this was kind of happening over the course of the 80s and early 90s. Um, and as a side note during this time, uh, Cyan had been making these games for kids like Cosmic Osmo and Spelunks. They had been exploring the idea of doing uh, a game for grownups too. They had a concept they called the Grey Summons, uh, which if this sounds familiar, it was going to be a fantasy adventure game in which, uh, as Robin Miller put it, you would have to make an ethical choice over the course of the game, um, kind of laying the foundation for what came later. But, you know, they shot the idea around, it didn't get picked up, um, but they were kind of exploring like what other kind of stories can we tell? What other kind of adventures can we make? Now, while all this was happening, uh, at the same time, big thing is happening. The CD-ROM format is taking off. Uh, the CD-ROM was, you know, it represents a huge leap in technology. Like it was compared to a floppy disk, a CD-ROM was like 500 times bigger. So you could put in higher quality graphics, audio, video, all these things as computers were getting more powerful too. It seemed like this giant canvas was expanding for what kind of things you could make. Um, sorry, one second, I just saw a little error message. I want to make sure my internet's been a little, a little iffy right now. So I think everything's okay. Okay, we're good. We're good. Um, but yeah, if you saw a Rand and Robin's keynote yesterday, they mentioned uh, the box that kind of constrains what kind of games you can make. And the CD-ROM was a, the box was just rapidly expanding and being blown up with all these new possibilities for what you could do. Um, as folks have mentioned in chat, uh, yeah, we got Peter Gabriel. Peter Gabriel did uh, produce a couple CD-ROMs. So it wasn't just, you know, people in the software industry. It wasn't just people making their games at home. It was, there was, you know, larger notice being taken across the, um, you know, across all kinds of fields. Uh, so there was a lot of interest growing in the CD-ROM. And I wanna talk about some of the stuff that was coming out during this period, during like 1990 up to the development of MIST. Uh, again, a lot of this stuff didn't necessarily directly impact MIST, but it was what was happening. It was all these things coming out as interest was being you know, generated in the CD-ROM multimedia type games. Um, one of the, important pieces of technology that this was happening was a new program was being developed called Director um, by a company called Macromind. And Director was, you know, Hypercar was a thing where you could like make a picture, you click on it, it goes to another picture. Director was like that taken, you know, into the stratosphere. Uh, it was meant to be for making these sort of interactive multimedia projects with high color graphics and video and all these extra bells and whistles. It was, you know, worlds beyond what Hypercard could do. It was really what ushered in this era of uh, multimedia, of like live action graphics and photographs and text and all these things being combined into one, you know, kind of interactive piece of software. 
Uh, and so director quickly became the standard for making this sort of thing. Uh, and the first time we really saw things start to start to coalesce with like, you know, could you make a game with video and audio and all this like other additional stuff? And the first place we really saw that take off was a game called Spaceship Warlock from 1991. If you want to talk about like milestone games before Myst, Spaceship Warlock is the milestone game. Uh, so this was a game that was, it was by uh, Joe Sparks and Mike Sands, a team of two people. Uh, Mike Sands was a comic artist and Joe Sparks was, I think he had just come out of NASA at that point and had been doing uh, 3D computer graphics. And so they made this game, as you can tell, it's stylized like an old, uh, like an old sci-fi serial story. And it just tries to do everything. There's action sequences, there's like, there's interactive dialogue where you type out messages there's, you know, music looping through it. There's a really catchy, annoying theme song to this game. Um, it was pushing things really, really far for the time. Um, to get a computer that could play this thing, I think, like, to get a Macintosh with a color monitor that could play Spaceship Warlock, it was, pro I think it was something around $2,000. So maybe able to correct me with that in chat, but it was, it was expensive, and they were just pushing it as far as they could. Um, the game is 123 megabytes large. And the reason it's that size is because that was the size of the biggest hard drive that Joe Sparks and Mike Sands had. And when they fill up the hard drive, they were just like, game's done. Okay, that's it. That's the end of the game. We ran out of hard drive space. So that's, uh, that's as big as it's gonna get. So like, if you saw, there was that great video Ars Technica did um, a while ago, the War Stories video where Rand Miller talks about all the technical constraints that they faced um, you know, fitting mist onto a CD-ROM. Uh, that seems like it was a walk in the park compared to Spaceship Warlock because Spaceship Warlock is just barely holding together. Uh, it has, you know, wild performance issues. The action sequences, like this one right here, where you have a fist fight with this guy, uh, are really uh, kind of rickety. They were just trying everything they could before there was ever a template for this kind of stuff. The game actually sold for $100 uh, the logic being that if you just spent 2000 bucks on a new computer and you wanted the only piece of software that could take full advantage of that computer, you'd pay a hundred bucks for what's another hundred bucks on top of the 2000 you just paid for your computer. Um, Joe Sparks tells a story of showing this game at a trade show. And afterwards, someone asked him, who allowed you to make this? Like, not like, how did you do this? But like, surely this must be illegal. Like, surely this is not a thing that human beings can make. There was nothing else like Spaceship Warlock at the time. And it's, it's often cited as being this milestone title for making these kind of CD-ROM multimedia games. And so more developers started springing up who are also using Director, who are also making games in this style. Uh, games like Hellcab over here. Um, Hellcab, which just a great name for a game. Um, I think actually uh, at last year's Mysterium, Marty O'Donnell mentioned this game as one of the inspirations for him getting into game development. I think it was Marty O'Donnell. But it's just a roller coaster. You get in like a cab that travels through time and you go back to like the ancient Roman era. It's, it's all over the place. And um, it's just a wild time, but it also has a lot of performance issues. Uh, the fight scenes, kind of a recurring trend going on. The fight scenes are not great in this game. Um, I think we can all be really grateful that um, there's no scene in Mist where you have like a fist fight with Atris because I think it took some of these early games to figure out that this kind of presentation is not really well suited to doing an action game. So you have a lot of these games just trying to figure out what works. Like uh, Spaceship Warlock and Hellcap are much more like kind of like whiz bang or roller coaster ride type things. But you also started to see a lot of developers. Um, you know, leaning into like making more atmospheric games, exploring sort of the exploratory stuff that Myst also uh, was exploring. One of those games, and I have to mention it because otherwise Kelly will destroy me, is uh, this game called The Labyrinth of Time that also came out uh, the same year that Myst did. And it's, I think it is a pretty artistically spectacular game, to, like even today. Um, it's this surreal adventure game where you go through this weird patchwork world of all these bizarre graphics. Um, I'm mentioning it because I think it was a game that was made in a similar spirit to Myst. There was a two-person team that made it. It was uh, Michael Todrovic and uh, Bradley W. Skank, and it was a technical person and an artist pairing together to make this game. Again, kind of similar to the team of, you know, Rand and Robin Miller. Um, but it was interesting because it was this small team, but there were also, you know, uh, there was a larger team starting to, uh, a larger 
world out there starting to look into this stuff. Uh, this game was actually published by Electronic Arts um, because they realized that this CD-ROM market was starting to grow and they wanted to find more games that could, you know, I think that was one of the reasons they took onto it. Uh, not 100% sure, but that seems to be the, you know, the chain of events. Um, the hilarious story is that uh, when they originally pitched this game to Electronic Arts, they gave them the design document of like, here's all what we're going to do. And Electronic Arts said, well, it, it just, it, the, it feels a little light. So, so they literally reprinted the design document on heavier paper and Electronic Arts accepted it. So just this, this small team just somehow working around this giant company to get this game published, which is kind of hilarious. Um, but like, there, so like Electronic Arts published this, uh, Hellcat was published by Time Warner. So like there were bigger companies saying, you know, there's something in this CD-ROM stuff, we should really get onto it. Um, and it was also spreading internationally too. It wasn't just confined to these, uh, you know, American companies. Uh, there was a company in Japan called Synergy Inc. that made a couple games like this in the lead up to Myst. Uh, the two ones in particular that did were uh, Alice, an interactive museum, and L-Zone. And what's interesting is they represent kind of this taking two different approaches to making a mist style game. Uh, Alice is a very dense game. It has a lot of like, it's a, you know, you walk through these different rooms that are just covered in art and you have to collect objects. And then L Zone is more of like this haunting ambient environment you wander through. Uh, so it was already, even in 1992, like again, like a year before mist happened, uh, there were already folks, you know, kind of exploring like what are the different different ways we can make this kind of puzzle adventure multimedia experience um relevant to mist by the way too uh l zone has this uh this train sequence that keeps coming up that uh is i think has a lot of similarities to the maze runner from mist not in terms of like it being a puzzle but because it does that same technique where it's like a little postage stamp video on the screen to get the video to load faster so even before mist was happening like there were people coming, like, you know, some of the same techniques that Mist used, there were already developers kind of experimenting with those and establishing those in the lead up. Um, but in, there are a couple titles that are, um, that, that are particularly big milestones that we have to talk about that were, that Mist has been compared to. One of those is a game called The Journeyman Project. Uh, I'm gonna really quickly take a sip of tea for my uh, Journeyman Project mug. I really like the Journeyman Project. So this game might be familiar to some people because it was developed by Presto Studios, uh, who went on to develop Mist 3. Uh, in fact, if you were at the Mist 3 panel earlier, uh, some of the folks there, uh, Michelle Kripalani and uh, Phil Saunders, worked on the Journeyman Project. Uh, it was it was a game that was directly inspired by sort of the spectacle of Spaceship Warlock. Uh, Michelle and his friends had uh, had played the game and thought like we can do something bigger like we can do like a big epic time travel adventure and so they made a big epic time travel adventure. Um, the game first got showed off in 1992 at uh, Macworld, which was a big industry event for Macintosh developers, and the hype just started to build until the game came out. Excuse me. Uh, so it was kind of a big deal. Like when it came, even when it came out in 1993, uh, eight months before Mist did. Uh, this was a huge deal. This was uh, one of the first games that really kind of put everything together in terms of like video and live action and this rich audio and exploratory worlds and narrative. It was it was in the same way that Spaceship Warlock raised the bar. Like this raised the bar even further. Um, and also, I think it made the, the right choice to not really have a lot of action sequences. Uh, no, no fist fights in the Journeyman Project. Um, but it was also, it was a game that was kind of leaning into the strengths and weaknesses of the CD-ROM. Like it was using some of those same techniques of like having a limited amount of video on the screen, uh, using a lot of static images and just things that would help the game load faster. Um, or, you know, having animations with lower frame rates for the sake of being able to, you know, so the computer could handle them. There's a, a section of the game, there's a big, uh, a big maze section uh, in the Journeyman Project that it gives you a timer of like somewhere around like 10 minutes. And the reason it has that timer, I think is because it was adjusted around how slowly the CD-ROM would load. That it was like, we need you to get through this maze section. If we give you a minute and you have a slow computer, that's not gonna happen. So they gave you a lot of time so that it had, you know, your computer had time to load each scene as you walked around is kind of what it seems like happened. Um, 
but again, it was also a game that was, you know, really working under a lot of technical constraints. Um, like a lot of these early CD-ROM games, it had a lot of performance issues to the point where um, the game eventually got re-released uh, as the Journeyman Project Turbo, with the big feature being that it ran faster. Um, so again, a lot of developers still trying out all these big ideas when there's not really a template yet. Uh, the other big game we have to talk about, though, is a game called The Seventh Guest, which also came out in 1993, the same year as Myst. Uh, it's a game in which you, you visit the mansion of the reclusive toy maker Henry Stoff, and you have to figure out the mystery of what happened on one fateful night in the mansion. And you, uh, there's less exploration in this game. It's not really the sort of like, you know, narrative atmospheric experience. It's much more, you know, you go from room to room and you solve puzzles. Um, but as you can see here, it had a lot of like live action graphics integrated into the game, which was still kind of a mind blowing thing happening at the time. Uh, there's this puzzle here where it's, you're literally just like interacting with soup cans. So it wasn't like, it wasn't trying to integrate the puzzles in the world in the way Myst was, but it was still, it was, you know, pushing what you could do with a CD-ROM with just all this, again, especially the live action footage integrated on top of everything, which is a really big deal. And even more so than the Journeyman Project, this game really broke through to a broader audience. Uh, it sold millions of copies. Uh, it won some awards over Myst this same year. So it, it was another big deal. Again, it's something that happened soon enough right next to Myst that it probably, it didn't really directly impact the development of Myst. But this is kind of what, this is was priming, you know, games like the Journeyman Project, games like The Seventh Guest were, you know, priming the audience of people who had computers to say like, there's something to the CD-ROM stuff. You can have all these interesting interactive experiences. Um, and that's, that's the environment that Cyan was working within. Cutting back to Cyan, um, what happened was in 1991, which was the same year that Spaceship Warlock came out, uh, they were approached by a company called Sunsoft. And this a Japanese company that had been, you know, looking at this CD-ROM stuff. And they were also one of the people saying, hey, you know, maybe there's something here. Maybe there's something more we can explore with CD-ROM games. And they were aware of Cyan's work uh, on the Manhole and Speedlunks and Cosmic Osmo. Um, and I think, that, you know, they, they recognized this trend of like all this multimedia stuff's happening. And they approached Cyan and said, we want you to make a game for us. We want you to make a CD-ROM game for us. Um, and they already, you know, they wanted to make a game that was for a more adult audience rather than just for children. And luckily, Cyan already had an idea for that. They had already done that thing with the Gray Summons. So they were able to dust that idea off. And that is eventually what became Myst, uh, which again existed because this larger company, uh, you know, sort of identified this, this trend in CD ROM games that was happening and decided to enlist Cyan to make one for them. Uh, and funny enough, even though, <clears throat> excuse me, got to have some water real quick. Excuse me. Uh, so even though Director was also becoming the standard for games at this time, for these kind of multimedia CD-ROM games, uh, Myst, Cyan was familiar with HyperCard, and so they made Myst in HyperCard, uh, which was the same program that was used to make Nico Gets Out. Uh, so it's really fun to just see that connection across time. It's kind of wild. Um, but there's a number of reasons, like, why was Myst a big game when the Journeyman Project wasn't? Um, and this came up during the keynote yesterday, too, you know, asking about, like, what led to Myst's success. And part of it was that, you know, this was a more exploratory game compared to like, uh, you know, compared to like Hellcap and Spaceship Warlock, which are these like kind of fast paced extreme experiences. This was a much, you know, something you could kind of explore at your own pace. There wasn't, you know, a Roman guy with a sword coming up trying to kill you during it. Um, and part of it was also because going back to that uh, War Stories video from Ars Technica, um, Myst was a game, you know, they, they had put a lot of effort into optimizing the experience. Uh, you know, a lot of these games like the Journeyman Project had some performance issues. And I think, I'm sure, you know, Myst did too, but they they seem to be very mindful about, uh, you know, like even just like how things were written onto the CD-ROM physically. So it would be like loaded at the correct speed. Um, so that was probably a factor too. But honestly, a big part of it, I think is timing and circumstance. The fact that there were already a couple big games, there was Spaceship Warlock, there was the Journeyman Project, there was the Seventh Guest, all leading directly up to the release of Myst. Uh, that, you know, these things had been priming the market, getting people interested in buying CD-ROM so that something like Myst could explode uh, after they came out. And so I think it's worth, you know, kind of recognizing that context around it, that, you know, Myst 
Mist is Mist is great. I, I love Mist, I, obviously, but like it was also something that was, you know, it it was part of a series of things that were happening more broadly in the software industry. And I think it benefited from that of being of coming after some of these uh, other games that were also breaking ground in this sort of uh, multimedia territory. So now I want to talk about some stuff that came after Mist, um, because you know Mist. Big success, almost immediately the game industry took notice, but even outside the game industry, there was a lot of interest. Uh, the software industry, uh, artists, there was suddenly a lot of attention to like, we can make interactive experiences like this. This was a game that kind of proved that to a lot of people. Uh, even like, you know, smaller independent development teams uh, were like, we can make something like Myst 2. Um, and what I meant was that there was a lot of attention now on this sort of game. There was also a lot of money involved in this sort of game. There were suddenly publishers and you know larger bodies that realized they could make something like Mist. They could fund something like Mist. Uh, people who might not have considered making a game like this before now realized it was an option. So, you know, you see some like some whole company springing up. Event. Like you know, I think there was a you know the Adventure Company and Dreamcatcher. These companies that. You know, were dedicated just to making mist style games started to spring up in you know the coming years but i want to focus on some of these stranger examples of the impact mist had because i think you know you can you know clearly say like you know yeah mist had a huge impact on the adventure genre it had a huge impact on video games but it's interesting to see where else it had an impact too um, but to give one game example though i want to mention this game called lighthouse the dark being uh, this was a game by Sierra Online, which is a company that is, I think, really well known for their adventure games. They had done a lot of, uh, you know, third person adventure stuff in years prior, like the King's Quest series, the Space Quest series. Uh, and in 1996, they released their own Mist style game called Lighthouse. And the story behind this game says volumes. Uh, what happened was the game's director, John Bach, he was an artist at Sierra, and he said one day, um, the head of Sierra, Ken Williams, comes into his office and puts a copy of Mist down on his desk and says, can you make this? And that's how Lighthouse got greenlit, was because uh, it was a direct response, like, we need to make something like Mist. Uh, so it's amazing to see this company that was like, you know, they were at the forefront of the adventure genre, and suddenly they found themselves up, like, they're back against the wall because you know, Mist had, not to, you know, like, overuse, like, the tech disruption stuff, but, like, Mist was such a a massive event in this genre that like companies like Sierra found themselves having to adjust to it. Uh, I just think that's a fascinating story that they, um, it, it was so directly a response to Mist coming out. But again, you also saw people outside the game industry also taking notice. Uh, there is this game called The Sacred Mirror of Kofun, which it is a mystery adventure game that was produced by Jean-Michel Cousteau, who is the son of Jacques Cousteau. It is a game that takes place largely underwater and is largely comprised of scuba diving footage. Kind of a weird choice, but what it meant was that suddenly all these other parties who were outside the game industry were taking notice like of this format and realizing we can make something like this too. We can also make a mist style game. We can use this to present our own ideas and our own, you know, the stuff, the stuff that matters to us. Um, so you got things like the son of Jacques Cousteau making his own mist style game, you know, to just talk about the ocean. Um, but my absolute favorite example of this is a game called Prince Interactive. Uh, Prince Interactive is a game it, that was produced by Prince, the musician, in which you go to a mist style version of his estate at Paisley Park, and you wander through all these mist inspired environments, and you interact like you, you find Prince memorabilia, and you watch music videos, and you get to visit his recording studio. It's like, like in Mist, like when you go to like the mechanical age and you get to look through all of Cirrus and Akinar's stuff, it's like that, but with Prince. It's so weird that this exists. Like this is a totally real thing that exists directly in response to Mist. Um, the the thing that I love is it even it even takes some of the imagery from Mist. Like uh, there is a book that you open up with a static page that you click on to go into the book. Like it's it is so clearly like borrowing from Mist to make this like. I guess like this vanity game for Prince, it's just fascinating this exists. I think it is one of my favorite kind of weird examples of the legacy of Myst uh, outside the video game industry. Um, but also going for a couple other weird ones. Uh, this, is, this is one I don't know too much about, but it was so weird I had to include it. 
It's a game called Earth Food. Uh, it is a sci-fi first-person adventure game. Um, it's really confusing. As you can see from the graphics, it's really rudimentary. Uh, I, I've seen this included on like a bundle CD. I don't know if it was ever sold independently, but what's interesting about Earth Food in the context of Myth, that's such a weird sentence. What's so interesting about Earth Food in the context of Myth is that it was made by just mostly this one dude, as far as I can tell, uh, Preston David Hunter. And so, you know, even though there was a lot of money and attention, even though you had, you know, whole teams coming in to make a mist style game for Prince, you also still had this tradition continuing of, you know, these small independent developers and making their own games like this. Uh, I just think it's, it's fascinating to see how it continued to impact um, independent game development, not just all these big publishers coming in, but also just other people thinking like, I gotta make my own mist style game, like Earth Food. But it also, it didn't just impact, um, one second here. But its impact on games and software wasn't just limited to, you know, adventure games. It's so interesting to see also how it impacted other genres, uh, specifically educational games. I think it's really interesting to see educational games were a big deal in the 1990s. Uh, that was with all this like CD-ROM stuff happening, uh, educational games were one of the few things that were like, really lucrative like people often you know companies would often make educational games because it was you know it was a more guaranteed success if you're making some kind of weird multimedia thing i don't, I don't want to you know totally write that off. i don't, don't want to be like disrespectful to the developers but like it was a there was a big market for educational software in the 90s and one of the interesting ones that came out of this collision of educational software and mist was the eyewitness virtual reality program. Uh, if anyone ever saw those eyewitness videos where it's, you know, it's like the science videos where it's this big virtual museum that the camera goes through, um, they turned those into a mist style game. Uh, it's so it, it's like you would get like, uh, this one is from eyewitness virtual reality birds. Uh, and you would wander through the virtual museum and click on things to learn about them. They did ones about like dinosaurs, uh, and it's very, it's, it's very clearly inspired by Myst, but like taking, like in any other time, this content would have just been like an encyclopedia on a CD-ROM that you would buy. But now there was this, this format that Myst had popularized where you could, you know, had these worlds you could explore. And so they kind of brought these two things together where you could, you know, you could have an encyclopedia that was blown up into a virtual world you could explore. Uh, it's, it's really interesting to see how those worlds got brought together. Um, and another example, and this, this is one of the, the stranger ones, but I have to mention it. Um, so there was a company in Monterey, California. It was a small company that made uh, simulation games for businesses. Like they would make games like, like SimCity. They would make games like that, but for like big companies. Like they made one for like the Environmental Protection Agency. They made one for the Chevron Oil Company. They made, you know, like SimCity type games. And at one point, they got commissioned by a nonprofit to make a game about the election process and like, you know, how campaign funding works and how campaign management works. But at some point in the process, the decision was made to make it into a mist style game. It was going to be a first person adventure mist style game about campaign finance. Uh, apparently it was such a disaster that the nonprofit client uh, ordered all the work on it to be destroyed and the game was never released uh, because you know, some things are just not meant to be joined together. Um, but it's just so fascinating to think that like this company that was making, you know, simulation games for businesses all of a sudden was like finding themselves in the position to make a mist type game because that was suddenly what was interesting to people. Um, that's just really weird. It's just such an odd collision of like, um, I don't know of all these different like worlds intersecting and kind of the weird way that mist impacted this strange, you know, this little company on the other side of the, well, it was, it was California. It wasn't the other side of the country, but just, just very unusual to see this direct impact that mist had. Need to have some more water. Excuse me. So the, um, the one other thing I wanted to mention though, was uh, a game called Obsidian that is fascinating. I, I mentioned it for a very silly reason. I'll show you in a second, but 
Obsidian's in, it's it's a, a mist style game that is it's pretty fantastic. It's this very heady game that deals with dreams and uh, it, it's it's great and you should play it if you can. But it was produced by this company called Rocket Science Games. It was a uh, a digital supergroup that was formed uh, to make multimedia CD-ROM games. It was formed uh, sort of like a, right around the time Mist was coming out, and there was since there was all this interest being generated in making you know CD-ROM games, they raised like sixteen million dollars in investments. Um, inevitably, the company you know things didn't pan out. Um, and this actually Obsidian was one of their last projects, but the company itself kind of embodies that like the hype of the era that was being fueled by Mist. There was so much interest in Mist style games that you know they would companies would sink, uh, you know investors would sink sixteen million dollars into a company to make CD-ROM games. Um, but the reason I wanted to mention it though was just this really this really quick Easter egg uh, in the game. So there's a part in in Obsidian where you uh, you go to this like nightmarish bureaucracy world and there's all these like there's the department of travel the department of hints and you have to like you know talk to all these different desks to get information and there's one desk in the bureaucracy called the department of uh, of homages I'm just gonna turn my video off so you can see this real quickly uh, oh video is not playing one second here Oh, what's going on, PowerPoint? Bring me the blue pages. <laughs> so it's um, it's just a very direct acknowledgement of the fact that this game exists because of Mist. Uh, I think it's just very funny to see that like very directly put into the game. Uh, just kind of hilarious. Um, and PowerPoint is, there we go. Okay. So I guess the point is why does any of this matter? Like, why am I giving this presentation at a mist convention? Why am I talking about non mist stuff to the mist community? And really it's because games don't happen in a vacuum. Mist was a big deal and it didn't happen by itself. It was part of this broader international trend of creating these exploratory games of experimenting with like the CD ROM multimedia format. It was something Cyan was, you know, they were working within. Uh, Mist was groundbreaking, but it wasn't. It wasn't alone in exploring this kind of area. Uh, I think it's worth knowing, especially for Mist fans. You know, like what context Mist existed in. Mist made a big ripple, but it was part of a series of ripples. Um, I think it's worth acknowledging that. Uh, you know, Mist is something that means a lot to the folks at Mysterium, uh, and I, I hope it's been it's interesting and useful to learn about you know kind of where Mist came from and the fact that it does fit into this bigger picture of software development that goes all the way back to Inigo Gets Out and all the way forward to uh, you know the election simulator that didn't end up working out. Um, I hope it, I hope it helps to see how it fits into that bigger picture because I think you know everything's part of a bigger story. We care about these things not just because they're fun but because they you know they speak to something bigger and. Mist is the same way too. And also some of these games are really cool and you should play the Journeyman Project and the Labyrinth of Time because they're great games. So as we wrap up this though, um, I wanna give a quick shout out by the way to uh, Richard Moss, the historian. Uh, I drew on a lot of his work uh, for this, uh, for the section about early Macintosh stuff. He has a wonderful book, I'll show the right here, wonderful book called The Secret History of Mac Gaming. Uh, it is a tome, it is huge. Uh, it is a just a terrific book about the, um, the history of Macintosh game development. Uh, it's got a whole chapter on Cyan. We've got, the, got all the stuff here. Um, so if you have found this stuff interesting, I would strongly recommend, I think the physical copy is out of print, but you can get it digitally still through uh, the publisher Unbound. Um, I would strongly recommend checking it out if you found any of this stuff interesting so far in this panel. Well, so far, it's the end of the panel. But uh, yeah, thanks to Richard uh, for doing that work. Uh, he was the one who I, I learned about uh, Inigo Gets Out from. So uh, check that book out. But otherwise, yeah, uh, we got about 15 minutes left. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. I'm going to drink some more tea because I am very parched right now. Uh, but otherwise, I will be uh, watching the Zoom chat to see what questions come in. And I'll try to look at the um, at the uh, YouTube chat too, because for there we go. 
try to keep my eye on both of them. Uh, also, folks mentioned, uh, I'm looking at it right now, and uh, folks mentioned the, uh, the game Bill Nye Stop the Rock. Yes, Bill Nye also was involved in a mist style game, which you have to stop a, if I remember right, it's like some kind of environmental cataclysm. Uh, but it's also, it's a first person thing where you wander through the, you know, fictional uh, Bill Nye headquarters uh, and interact with live action Bill Nye. So a lot of folks were taking interest in this stuff. It is really funny to see the direct impact that came out of people saying like, oh, Mist is really good. We should do something like that. That it was even like, you know, the Discovery Channel. Um, I think the Discovery Channel actually put out a couple like science educational games. Um, <laughs> just kind of fascinating that it had such a, such a, a, a wide impact. Um, yeah, Robert in chat says, you explore nine labs, which was interesting to see the lab segments from a show realized in the 3D explorable space. That is kind of fascinating. Um, I didn't mention it during the panel, um, but there was also, this is, I think has been mentioned at Mysterium before, there was a missed parody game called Pissed, starring live action John Goodman. Uh, it was by a company called Parity Interactive that made like like the equivalent of scary movie of games, just like these like reference humor parodies. They're all really not great, um, but there is a parody version of Mist out there starring John Goodman and we can't change that. So that, that's a thing that happened too. Um, we also got uh, questions. Okay, see, there's there's the questions about Pissed coming in. Okay. Uh, we also got a question from uh, Greg. It says, what about Peter Gabriel's Explorer? Yes, so Peter Gabriel did a couple CD-ROM games. Uh, Real World, uh, his his company from which he does all his publishing stuff, uh, put out three CD-ROM games over time. They put out uh, Explora, which is more like a, I guess almost like a Peter Gabriel encyclopedia sort of thing. Uh, they put out an interactive book called uh, Ceremony of Innocence. Uh, but they also put out, I think the most mist-like of his games, we put out a game called Eve, where you wander through these like, surrealistic collage environments and you interact with Peter Gabriel's music and you explore themes about like love and relationships. Uh, it's real weird. It doesn't have a whole lot in common with Mist. I think he was really using, he, he has said in like the manual for those games, that, like he really believed in the power of multimedia as being this medium of expression. I don't know if he was directly impacted by Mist, but I think he was the attention that was being heaped on that whole medium of CD-ROM games, being able to combine all these elements together, like some of the other uh, games we talked about earlier, that was exciting to him. So again, even if it wasn't, I don't know that those games were directly impacted by Mist, but they were definitely impacted by the same environment that Mist was impacted by. Uh, it's just kind of funny to think that um, that uh, Peter-Gabriel's involvement in this kind of thing came before Mist 4. Uh, I wonder if anyone's ever asked him about uh, whether he knew about Mist beforehand. I couldn't find any quotes uh, about from him about like, you know, like, oh, Mist was so inspirational for me, but I, I wondered that too. Uh, sorry, checking through chats. And some folks are mentioning some other, uh, some other Mist parodies too. Um, yeah, there were a lot. Uh, there was even, there was a, um, there was a first person shooter for the Macintosh called Marathon that was really popular. And someone, made a very rudimentary recreation of Mist Island uh, in the game Marathon, which is hard because there's no like scripting in Marathon, but someone did it and it's kind of amazing. Uh, more folks mentioning things in, uh, in chat. Uh, Shadowgate, yeah, Shadowgate was another one of the, um, the Mac Venture games earlier. Uh, Deja Vu is the only one Rand Miller mentioned specifically. But, uh, but yeah, that was, that was the kind of thing that was happening in Macintosh game was like the, those early black and white Macintosh games were sort of the, the middle step between, you know, text adventure things like Zork and then the like full color experiences like Spaceship Warlock that would come out a few years later. Uh, so it's kind of fun to see all those steps in the process to see like, you know, everything from text-based game kind of building on itself until you lead up to some of the more modern games folks are mentioning in here, like uh, Quirt and things like that. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of folks mentioning um, a, a lot of modern Mist-type games, too. It's definitely, there definitely were a lot of games that are, are pretty clearly directly inspired by Mist. Um, I, I think it's, it is fun to see the way, the, how the impact the game had um, outside of just that subgenre, too. 
just, again, especially like that, like the uh, educational stuff. I think it's just fascinating to see how all those, all those different spheres kind of connect together. Uh, oh yeah, people are just bringing up all sorts of uh, uh, mistyped games. Yeah, there, there was, there was a lot. Um, and also because I saw some folks also mentioning this earlier in the chat, uh, a lot of these games are available on digital marketplaces now. Um, I think there are some that are caught up. I think part of the issue is um, Macromedia Director, that kind of foundational program uh, that we talked about earlier. Um, it's kind of challenging to get things that were made in Macromedia Director to run on modern computers. Um, you know, something like, uh, you know, Riven, for instance, was written in its own like custom engine that's been incorporated into, you know, it's easier to like port that to other platforms, things like that. Uh, director games, it was, you know, kind of a black box. Like you would just make, you would make your thing director and it would spit out a program and that was what you had. And it's kind of hard to port that to modern platforms so easily. Uh, so some things like Spaceship Warlock is not available for resale because it's, um, you know, it's, it's hard to get it working on modern computers. Uh, even the very first Dreaming Project game is not available on digital marketplaces, uh, from what I understand for a similar reason. Um, but some of the other ones, Labyrinth of Time is available for sale too. So if these have, if any of these have been interesting to you, uh, check digital marketplaces. Some of them may be, um, some of them may be available to play. And yeah, so as folks are, um, as folks are mentioning in chat, um, uh, there is a program called Scum VM, which can play a lot of adventure games like uh, like Riven um, and The Labyrinth of Time, and they have been working on implementing doing Macromedia Director uh, in Scum VM, which would be great because it would open up all these older games, things like Spaceship Warlock that are, I think, largely out of the discourse because they're kind of they're so. I'm going to go into game preservation right now. Here we go. Um, they've kind of fallen out of the like the you know the discourse and talking about history because they're so much harder to play. They're not immediately in people's minds. The, the things that are uh, easier to get to are, you know, that, that's what we think of when we think about like historically important games because that's what people have access to. Uh, so if there's more support for director games on like other platforms, like that's, that's gonna be really important to making sure, you know, people understand the context around this stuff that people can look back at this long taproot of games and be able to draw on it. Uh, so that'll be really exciting if that happens. Uh, there was also, um, uh, Robert, I think in chat earlier mentioned the, uh, yes, there was a mist style game about Frankenstein starring Tim Curry. Uh, again, I think a lot of that happened because there was just a lot of, there was a lot of interest and money in making mist type games so that you could now, you know, afford to hire Tim Curry or John Goodman to make your game because, you know, investors were looking at what was the new exciting thing and it was CD ROMs. And so that's what they wanted to, you know, put their money into. I think a big factor besides, you know, just like, first person shooters becoming a bigger deal and all that. Like, I think a big factor in these sort of the, the ebbing of mist style games in the late nineties is that the money started to go elsewhere. Um, you know, the internet was exciting. Uh, so people started directing more attention towards doing things on the internet and less towards, you know, uh, making CD-ROM games necessarily. Um, so it, it is funny to, uh, to see that, to see, um, during that era when there was a lot of attention, people really wanted to get in on the multimedia thing. The fact that like they could hire Tim Curry to be in their Frankenstein game. Um, so we have two things here. So we have uh, a question from Catherine who says, uh, Mist has such beautiful atmospheric setting audio and music. Is that pre-configured in any of these older titles or was Mist super pioneering in that aspect? Um, audio was definitely, I think it varied. Um, Thinking about some of the specific games I mentioned, like Spaceship Warlock and um, and the Journeyman Project. Sorry, I'm trying to think of the best way to answer this. Uh, Spaceship Warlock is funny because it um, it does have music, but because of the slow speed of CD-ROM drives and because of you know the fact that they were still trying to figure out how to do all this, the music is really just like 10 second snippets that repeat over and over. It's not nearly as rich as like Mist's soundscape because people were still trying to figure out you know, the best way to do this. So like the theme song of Spaceship Warlock is just uh, Joe Sparks uh, singing Spaceship Warlock over and over and over again, just looping endlessly. Um, but as, as people started to get more comfortable with like how to stream things from CD-ROMs, as computers got a little better at, you know, having the processing power to deal with this, uh, games like the Journeyman Project did have a lot of rich audio as well. Um, 
that has a really incredible soundtrack, uh, the Journeyman Project too. So I think it was something that a, as people got more familiar with these type of games, uh, the audio became richer as well. In the same way that like the graphics became richer and everything like that. Uh, we also have Anna Cat asks, uh, wasn't there a Myst style game with Cher in it? Um, that's a good question. I can't remember off the top of my head. There was a Mist style game with Laurie Anderson. I don't know if that might be the one you're thinking of. There were a lot of musician CD-ROMs though. Uh, like there are the Peter Gabriel ones. I think there was a CD-ROM game based on Queen. I know, I think there was a Devo one also. Again, a lot of these folks outside the industry saying like, we can make something like this. We can make this kind of interactive world experience um, to varying degrees of quality. Um, David Bowie famously, uh, developed a, helped develop, I guess, produced or was involved in a CD-ROM based on uh, some of his music. And he was famously not happy with it uh, because of just like the low quality video and just all the constraints that come with working on CD-ROMs. So I don't know about Cher specifically. I can't think of anything like that, but there definitely, there was a lot of interest in the music industry and like how they could use that as like an extension for an artist or a band just you know creating a virtual space to be in um i don't think sure though that would be amazing i always thought um i always thought kate bush would have done an amazing cd rom i feel like that just would have been totally up her alley shout out to kate bush uh we also have a question uh from Stead steadmeister steadmister who says where do you see the future of mist style adventure games headed uh that's really interesting because um these sort of like the if, if, if we're talking about like this same style of like there being a big boom and stuff, I think obviously, you know, VR is where all the attention and money is now. Like that's where I think Cyan is starting to head too, like with Firmament is doing that sort of uh, VR development. If we're talking about like the future of mist type games, like this sort of point and click game, I think with a lot of these genres, there reaches a point where everything coming out from it tends to be fans who are nostalgic for the old games now making their own games inspired by that. I think you see a lot of those like, you know, you see a lot of like retro style platformers from people who are like, oh, I loved Mario growing up. I loved Mega Man going, like, growing up. I want to make more games like that. And so I think as you see more Myst type games, I think that tends to be people who are like intentionally channeling that Myst type experience. Um, if we're talking, but I think a lot of the techniques in Myst have kind of been, you know, have found their way into other types of games too. Like the sort of like first person narrative experiences also drawing on some of the, you know, techniques established by Myst. Um, but if we're talking about like, like if we've been looking at this in terms of waves, in terms of like, you know, the early Macintosh games, and then, you know, as, as graphics capabilities build up, as interest in the CD-ROM swells, I think VR is definitely where the, the money and attention is now that you might see that same sort of additional swelling. And I think inevitably the same sort of ebb um, once, you know, if and when it pans out that like, you know, VR games, you can't just dump hundred million dollars in the VR games and expect to get the money back. I think we'll probably see a similar process happening with that, whatever that next wave building on the last wave of these type of games is. Um, and yeah, so also really quick, we're running out of time, but I see a comment in chat from Phil who said that, yes, so David Lynch was considering developing an adventure game. Oh, sorry, I'm also running through chat. Uh, Okay, so the, the game with Cher was nine, The Last Resort. I really want to play that now. I really want to see the adventure game with Cher. I'm so curious about that. Um, David Lynch was looking into making an adventure game. Uh, he was working with Synergy, the folks who uh, made Alice an Interactive Museum and L-Zone. It didn't pan out, but uh, that would have been amazing to see a David Lynch uh, mist style game. And there was also a question I missed here from Matt Johnson saying, what is your personal favorite mist clone? I say, holding my Journeyman Project mug. Um, I love the Journeyman Project, uh, but also the Labyrinth of Time has always been a personal favorite. Uh, that one, I've just always, you know, for for years and years, it's always just the, the e expressive, surrealistic art style is still pretty fantastic. And I think uh, as a game, you know, it has some hitches there. It's, a, it's largely a game made up of mazes. And I think if you're not interested in solving mazes, it's probably not, there's not going to be a whole lot there for you. Uh, and there's like slider puzzles and a lot of the stock puzzles, but it's uh, just visually, it's it's pretty fantastic. Oh, uh, we are out of time, but uh, Kelly has one question. Oh, no, Kelly just mentioning Shivers. Yes, yeah, Shivers is another game that is also in this kind of style. That's, that's pretty, uh, pretty visually compelling to look at. But we are out of time. It is 7.30. Thank you all so much 
uh, for coming to the panel. I'm really, I hope you all enjoyed this, seeing kind of the long connection between Mist, what came before, what came after. Um, take it with you. Try some of these things out. Think about broader historical context, and I will see you over the course of the weekend. Take care. Have a good Mysterium.